This processor has 8 cores, 128 threads, and runs at 5.5 GHz. Where it is totally different than your average server processor is that it can expand to 32 processor systems, and you can access up to 2.88 GB of level 4 cache on a core. Plus, there's 192 PCIe Gen 5 slots, up to 64 terabytes of memory using current memory modules, and it has a built-in AI accelerator. What is more, we got to go behind the scenes and see some of the crazy engineering that lets these systems continue processing the world's most important transactions, even during an 8.3 magnitude earthquake. Hey guys, this is Patrick from STH, and today we're gonna look at the new IBM Z17 mainframe, as well as the new Telum 2 processor and Spire AI accelerator. Now, I know many folks even watching this video will think, hey, I have no use for mainframes, but that's entirely not true. If you use a credit card, check your bank balance, maybe even do things like book an airline flight or try to get insurance, well, you're using a mainframe. In fact, most people use mainframes every single day. Now, as a quick note, we are doing this at IBM facilities and we have special access. We need to say that this video is sponsored by IBM. Still, I told IBM, we are not gonna do this video unless we can show cool stuff and cool stuff we're going to show. And that's going well beyond just the processors themselves. As examples, we're gonna show the processors cut in half, the liquid cooling that goes into these and much more. First, we're gonna talk about the Telum 2 processor and Spire AI Accelerator. Both add more AI to mainframes, which can have wild ROI because the people that are using these mainframes are the financial institutions, insurance companies, and so forth, trying to do things like detect billions of dollars of fraud. And due to the nature of the transactions, they're trying to do that in real time while also doing it securely because this has to have things like quantum safe encryption. After getting the processors, I wanna get to some of the system bits and sprinkled in between, I wanna get to a bunch of the stuff that we got to see up at the IBM Fishkill New York facility where they have crazy labs. They have things like tunneling electron microscopes that can see individual silicon atoms. They can also see things like metal layers interacting on multi-million dollar machines that are so sensitive that if someone's washing windows on the other side of campus or the other side of the building, they can actually see that in their test data. First off, let's start with the basics. Mainframes are designed to be the reliable systems of record for the world's mission critical transactions. That means that they're not designed to be as cheap as possible. Instead, they need to be scalable and handle enormous volumes, many times that of even like search volumes and reliable or 99.999999% percent reliability. These systems are designed with the highest reliability in the industry. We talk about eight nines of availability, which is less than a second of downtime in a given year. What does that mean to you? We can withstand an 8.3 magnitude earthquake and you can still use your credit cards and check your checking account balances. So instead of being made up of components from different vendors, IBM has to make everything because they need to not only design, but also test and support the entire system up to that level of reliability, which means they have absolutely crazy things that go on behind the scenes to ensure they can hit that number. And just starting out, here's me next to one of the Z17 mainframes, or at least that's a single rack of the mainframes because they can occupy, of course, several racks. A fun fact from Ross, who I met, who is the general manager of IBM Z and Linux One. So what's the coolest feature that I think is in Z17? The doors have been completely redesigned. We made it so that we could ship them with the system, but they're functional, like electromagnetics, sound, and of course, all of the airflow that has to go through them. Yeah, even the doors are cool. Inside, there's a few major subsystems. First, there are the processing drawers that hold the processors and memory. There's then PCIe and IO drawers for just that PCIe cards and IO. There's also a big radiator for its liquid cooling. And there are support servers just to manage and support the system. At the heart of the IBM Z17 mainframe is the processor drawer. Unlike smaller servers, this is just one of up to four drawers. Each drawer can contain four sockets that can be populated with dual chip modules or DCMs. Now DCMs have two five nanometer Telum 2 processors. The Telum 2 is listed as having eight cores, but each core can have up to 16 threads, which means you can get up to 128 threads on a single die or up to 256 threads per DCM. What's more, the caches can be shared among different cores, giving huge pools of cache for processor cores that need it, reaching up to like 2.88 gigabytes of level four cache. 
On board, there's a discrete AI accelerator that can be called securely by those cores and help accelerate algorithms in real time without having to move off the die. Further, each die has its own DPU, which is a discrete area of the chip that's designed to move data securely among the massive system. These machines are vast, with configurations currently going up to 208 cores or 3,328 threads. And by the way, if you were counting eight cores per processor and up to 32 of the processors per system, you might say 256. But of course, there's some binning that goes on because each die needs to be able to run reliably at 5.5 gigahertz nonstop. And other cores need to be reserved for system tasks, so that way the full 208 cores can be used for processing. Now, the headers on the top of the CPU package are SMP cables. These SMP cables allow each processor to connect to other processors in the mainframe. We got to see some of the amazing tools the team had looking at cross sections of these connectors where they can see one wire is not connected without having to even open up the connector. Cooling these processors is done via liquid cooling also at the top of the chip. But something that's different with these versus your traditional server processors is that the liquid cooling on here is a lot more complex. First off, the liquid cooling is now using a glycol mixture instead of just using distilled water. And that's a change from previous generations. When we look at traditional server processors that are liquid cooled, oftentimes you just get like a hunk of metal that's scratched out with little channels and stuff for the liquid. But this is very different. There are things like pistons to ensure that you have even pressure. So that way the chips are cooled properly. Now, of course, that liquid cooling has to dissipate heat somewhere, and that's really at the radiator. Uh, the systems have a radiator cooling inside, and so those systems are designed to run for 10 years with never being serviced. Now, think about your car. If your car was never serviced, running 24-7 for 10 years, that means the radiator would run for almost a million miles without being serviced. Now, of course, that liquid cooling goes to the rear of the processing drawer. And there you can see that we have a bunch of cards that connect to our IO trace as well as the liquid cooling loops. Now, IBM has been doing liquid cooling in mainframes for a long time. So all of these connectors have to be tested thoroughly to make sure that not only do they uh, you know, disconnect cleanly without any drops or anything like that, but also that they maintain that reliability because again, you only want to service these liquid cooling units at a maximum of something like once every 10 years. One thing that we saw that was fun in the cutaway of the radiator is that they actually use a PCB for all the power delivery instead of just using wires. Like normally we'd see in servers that everything would be wire-based. And I asked like, hey, why are you using a PCB instead? And they just said it's a lot more reliable. So I guess that's kind of like another little change that they will make a custom PCB just to avoid having to go and string wires, which is neat. A couple other fun things though on that processing drawer before we continue to move on is the memory. Now in a normal server, you might see a bunch of dim slots, but these are actually custom modules for the Z17 that allow you to get higher density of memory. And that's really what gives us up to that 64 terabytes of memory. Two other fun things. I asked what these boards are in the middle that are cut away and have all these components. They are actually similar to like your power delivery. Like if you had a motherboard, like a consumer motherboard, they'd be like your VRMs and all those types of components. And they're on serviceable modules. So that way, you know, if you do have to go and service a system, you can do that. The other really cool thing is the motherboard PCB. Now this may not seem like a big thing, but I was just kind of counting in the photos and I think I got to like 40 or something layers in that PCB. A lot of times, you know, you see motherboards in the like eight to 12 layer range. And this is something that's totally different because there's so much going on here. Now, earlier I mentioned that PCIe and IO drawer. Now, one of the fun things about this is that this is where you would have things like your network interfaces and all of that. There's a bunch of PCIe slots here and these PCIe slots take up to 75 watt PCIe cards. And that's just been standard for a while. Now these PCIe and IO drawers can connect to multiple nodes via the cards that are in the back of those compute drawers. But the other thing that I think is really neat about them is that the PCIe cards just aren't like just slotted in like normal. They're actually on these serviceable little sleds and that's how they're getting serviceability even on these drawers. Now, a couple fun facts on these IO drawers. Now, first off, there are a ton of them in the system, but second thing is you can get up to 192 PCIe cards in a single Z17 mainframe, which is uh, you know enormous. And for our purposes, one of the most interesting use cases is the new IBM Spire. This is a 75 watt AI processor that has 128 gigabytes of memory. And you can take eight of these Spire AI cards put them into one of these PCIe IO drawers and get a one terabyte like little cluster of AI accelerators. Now the entire system goes up to 48 of these, which gives you like six 
terabytes of memory for your AI accelerators. And that six terabytes of memory, of course, does not include the 64 terabytes of memory you can have connected to your processors and any of the AI accelerators that are in all of the processors in your system. So there are a ton of acceleration options here. One of the big reasons that that's important is that these systems are used to process all of these real-time transactions. So if you want to have a use case for really figuring out like, you know, why do we want to use AI? Like this is the poster child for it, right? Because if you have all of the AI acceleration and you can come up with algorithms that can find things like fraud or, you know, suspicious activity, then you can start blocking transactions and that can have billions of dollars of savings that are directly attributable to using AI in systems like these. One of the other really important bits of this is that by having the AI acceleration happen on the mainframe itself, that means that if you are a bank or another financial institution, insurance company, any of that kind of stuff, you don't have to go and take the data and move it to another cluster, which means, you know, you'd have to like encrypt your network traffic to that cluster, ensure that the data remains encrypted on that other cluster and then brought back into the system. And then, you know, like, like that's just a long path to have to deal with. IBM offers the security with quantum safe encryption standards that allows you to actually go do this without having to deal with going off platform for security purposes. Plus by not having to go off platform, you don't have to go and do a performance hit of going over the network. And something I didn't know before doing this, but I definitely asked was, you know, like how much power does a mainframe use? And the answer is usually like on a, you know, higher end config somewhere in that like 30 to 40 kilowatt range. And so I asked like, you know, is there any thought of doing higher density or any of that kind of stuff? And one of the interesting things that I just kind of learned is that they use 42U racks generally because, well, that's what their customers use and what all the facilities are designed for, but also staying in that power envelope allows a user of a mainframe to take out older generations, put in the new generations and not have to drop more power. That's been a big thing on the AI side when you just get to like large GPU clusters. And so everything in the system is designed so it still fits in that footprint. So the reason that the AI accelerators are 75 watts, not more, or at least one of them is because, well, you can put them in the existing PCIe IO drawers and you don't have to increase your power budget going to these in usually pretty pricey data center locations, right? Now for all of our videos, I like to have a key lessons learned. I mean, what do we learn by going out and doing this? Like first thing I learned was, oh my gosh, there is a ton of really cool technology here, right? The fact of the matter is that these are not just like processors that are similar to, you know, some of the just kind of standard server processors. These things are designed to a completely different level because they have to hit completely different reliability specs. Also the systems are not designed necessarily to just have like one CPU, they're designed to have 32 and that's just normal, right? The other big one though, was just frankly the lengths that IBM engineering goes through to ensure that all of these components work themselves, but also all of them work together. I mean, these are truly systems that are engineered end to end, which I think is really cool. I think I kind of knew that going into this, but I had no idea until I went to the labs and just saw what folks were doing to check out the different components and, and you know, what potentially could fail and all that kind of stuff. It was just mind blowing. And the last one I think is really just around the use of AI. And the reason for that is kind of simple, right? There are a bunch of applications out there where the AI application, you know, you can make it, but you don't really know how to monetize it. I mean, what is the ROI? You spend a bunch of money on compute, hopefully you get users and at some point you can monetize them. But this is completely different, right? The number of transactions that go over these IBM Z mainframes is enormous. And just the ability to run secure local AI on the mainframe itself really gives folks the ability to do things like combat fraud, which has a huge ROI number tied to it. Now to film this video, we went to three different IBM locations and I talked to like, I don't even know how many people, but a ton of folks, both in terms of the customers of IBM, but also IBMers. And one of the questions I just asked a lot of folks, just because we had customers, we had partners, we had the IBM folks there. I, I wanted to know, you know, how do you even get started in a mainframe, right? I mean, like I get the idea of a computer server that's kind of like a standard server because you can start with an old desktop or something, build that into a server and, you know, really learn your skills on Linux that way. So I kind of asked like, you know, what would you do if you wanted to get into mainframes? And uh, it turns out that there's like an entire pipeline process for this. Honestly, eight years ago when I joined IBM, I had no idea even how to spell mainframe. And when I told my mom that I got accepted here, she's like, do they still make mainframes? And she's a computer engineer from the 70s. And yes, of course, mainframes have been there for 60 years. 
And one of the reasons I love that story and we stuck it in the video is that my mother actually, she used to program mainframes back at Bell Labs back in the day. And so I just thought like, hey, that's crazy, right? So we had to include that, of course. And so there's actually a pipeline process to do all the training and stuff. And why that matters is that like, let's say you wanted to go create something for AI or, uh, you know, you're kind of looking at like what you want to do. Um, you know, frankly, you can make AI algorithms that have giant impacts by putting them just or just developing them on the IBM mainframe. Also, if you just want to work with like really cool hardware, I can tell you guys everything from the folks that did, you know, the material science stuff to failure analysis, all the chemistry stuff. I mean, there were amazing teams and equipment behind making sure that these things are reliable. So from an engineering perspective, I think there's a lot of cool stuff there, but also just if you want to work on these large systems while they're operating, um, I think there's a ton of opportunity there. This is the top Sims. I absolutely love it. It's one of only a few in the United States and we get to look at part per billion sensitivities and some of the craziest chemical compounds you've ever seen. And hey guys, I know that not everybody that is watching this video is gonna go out and buy one of these, but on the other hand, it was super cool to get to look at because frankly, we just don't get to look at cool things in this level of detail often. But something that certainly struck me while I was doing this video was just all the IBMers came out and they were so happy to go and share all of the cool things about Z17, Tellum, Spire, and all of the subsystems and all the work that goes into making these reliable systems. So I just wanna say a big thank you to all of those folks. And hey guys, I hope you really liked this video. You know, this was a cool one to get to go do. And I know on STH, we have a number of folks that use mainframes in their daily jobs. Every once in a while, you'll see them post a comment or something like that. So if you do wanna learn more, that's a good place maybe to start. Also, we'll put a link in the description to somewhere you can go to learn more about Z17. Of course, we couldn't obviously get through everything in this video, but I think we got through a lot of it. And since this is cool and you don't really get to see it that often, if you did like this video, we'll definitely share it with your friends and colleagues, but also give it a like, click subscribe, and turn on those notifications so you can see whenever we come out with great new videos. As always, thanks for watching. Have an awesome day.